So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tanmay Bakshi and today we're going to be going over actually a brand new series of mine called Swift Today. In this series, I'm going to be covering the latest in the world of the Swift programming language, things that would affect your development and the way you do it. Today, I'm talking about something that really changes the way you're going to be using not just Swift, but another programming language altogether. Python. Now, of course, Python is a language that is used for a ton of different purposes. It's great for scripting, and it's also great for things like data science and machine learning because of how easy its syntax is, but at the same time, you can call direct C code, and so it's very low level. It's the perfect com combination of performance and syntax. Now, with Swift, however, things haven't really been all that great in the world of data science, at least since it was released. Recently, though, Apple has been working towards fixing that. They've released new tools like, for example, CreateML and CoreML that enable developers to use the hardware of Apple's own, well, computers, and train their own neural networks or machine learning algorithms directly on them. Apple's also released a few different Python packages, and of course, this is all open source in terms of Python, that enable you to develop machine learning learning models very quickly and export them for use directly into your iOS application powered by Swift. One of these packages called Curry Create is really convenient for training machine learning models. In fact, I've actually already gone through that in another video of mine. But today though, I'm talking about something all new altogether. I'm talking about running Python code directly within the Swift programming language. Now this is really interesting stuff and it will really be changing the way that you do practically everything when it comes to Python and Swift combined. Now, again, Swift can actually work with Objective-C code. We know that you can bridge between your new Swift code and your old Objective-C code through Xcode by implementing a simple bridging header. Now, there's already a framework within this entire Apple suite of products called the Python framework. Now, the Python framework enables you to essentially build or run Python code, interpret Python code actually, directly within the Swift language or the Objective-C language. However, it wasn't really convenient to use. If anything, it was very difficult to use and barely anyone has used it for almost anything. Plus, it doesn't really run on iOS, but then again, neither does this just yet. However, with this new version of this Python Swift bridge, you can very, very conveniently run Python code directly within Swift using, of course, Swift syntax, essentially calling Python functions or Python libraries directly within the Swift programming language. Now, this is made possible by two new additions to Swift coming with Swift 5 in the next few weeks. These two additions are the dynamic member and dynamic callable attributes. Now, essentially what these do is they enable certain classes, like for example, a Python class in this case, to actually uh, be called completely dynamically. So for example, with the dynamic member lookup, let's just say you've got a certain class in Python, say the class is called animal, and there are certain attributes within that class, like for example, species. Now, if you wanted to access that within Swift, you'd have to call a function in the Python class, pass the name of the variable as a string, and then get that response. But now you can actually take that Python class and just do Python class dot species, and it'll automatically send that over to the same function that you would have sent it to anyway. And so it's essentially a lot of syntax sugar that makes it very, very easy to use. Now, if you're wondering why Apple would go ahead and do this, it's actually because of a pretty interesting story. You see, of course, the creator of the Swift programming language, the person who created the very first commit back in 2010, his name's Chris Latner, used to work for Apple, but he left Apple a little while ago to join Tesla because he was very interested in machine learning and next generation technology. So he headed their autopilot division. Now, after that, again, he wanted to do something new, so he went over to Google. Now, at Google, he was in charge of TensorFlow, and his idea was to create a kind of TensorFlow for Swift. The only problem, though, is that even if he were to rewrite TensorFlow to work with Swift, there would still be one key problem. 
and that is that there are, all, there are already so many individual packages and libraries built for the Python programming language that translating them all to Swift, like NumPy, Sippy, all these other packages, translating them to Swift completely is nearly impossible. And so that's why not only did he create Swift for TensorFlow, which has its own advantages that we'll probably cover in a later episode of Swift today, but instead, he actually created new bindings altogether in order to enable this kind of dynamic member lookup and dynamic callable attributes in order to call Python directly from Swift. But that gets me now to what we're going to be doing today. Today, I'm going to be showing you an example of how you can actually use Python code directly within Swift, doing two things. First of all, using other Python packages that you may have installed through, say, pip directly within your Swift code. And then from there, how you can actually write your own Python code and then uh, enable that Python code to run with your Swift applications, just like you would Objective-C code. But one more thing you should note, however, is that this will not work on iOS. It only runs on Mac OS so far, and it has not been tested on Linux. Now, eventually, this Python binding will be available directly within the Swift for TensorFlow repository and build because Chris Latner and his team are actually rebuilding the Swift compiler to work with TensorFlow very, very well and TensorFlow's graphs. However, because these Python bindings aren't available in the actual Swift programming language yet, there's actually a great GitHub repository that has taken this whole Python binding code from the Swift for TensorFlow project and put that onto a package available on the Swift package manager. There will be a link to this repository down in the description below, and that is the repository we're going to be using today. So now, without any further ado, let's head over to the Mac part where I'm going to be showing you how exactly you can build an application that uses sklearn to do a principal component analysis on the iris data set and then visualize it with matplotlib. All right, so welcome back to the code and now let's take a look at how exactly you can implement this Swift Python bridge. First though, let's take a look at the GitHub repo. This over here is Python Kit. It uses the code by the Swift for TensorFlow team in order to implement this Swift framework to interact with Python. It requires Swift 5 or higher and indeed has been tested on both Mac OS and Linux. Now, this is an example of how exactly you can use it. As you can see, very similar code between Swift and Python, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Now, this is an example of how exactly you can build it, but I kind of cheated here a little bit. If you take a look inside the Python kit directory, you essentially just got four main code files, and that's really it. So what I've done for now, and remember, this is not an optimal practice. This is not what you want to do in your apps. I've actually gone ahead and downloaded those four files and implemented them directly into my application. Now, for your app, I highly, highly recommend you actually use the Swift Package Manager. However, in this case, for the sake of the demo of the YouTube video, I haven't actually used the Swift Package Manager for simplicity. Now, apart from just the actual Xcode project, I've also created a new directory in my home folder called iris example. Now the iris example folder contains just one Python file, the iris example.py file. Now if we enter this file, as you can see, this is essentially sample code from the scikit-learn um, website. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put a link in the description to this code. However, I have modified it slightly in order to be to, in order to work with functions. So instead of running the Python script and it goes ahead and runs the principal component analysis and then visualizes that with matplotlib, instead it'll actually have a function that would do that for you. Now if I exit out of this, in regular Python, the way I'd use this file is by going over and doing import iris example, or actually from iris example, a more a cleaner way to do it, from iris example, import plot PCA iris, or iris plot PCA. Let's actually go ahead and check plot PCA iris. So if I just go ahead and kill the earlier Python process, as you can see, I should be able to go ahead and say from iris example, import star, 
There we go, it imports the function directly from that file. And then if I go into the file, I take the function, I copy the function name, I continue my process here. Ooh, Python doesn't like to be restarted. I should be able to go ahead and import and then run the function. Now, right as I run the function here, you should see that it comes up with this visualization. Now, the iris data set for each individual flower in the data set has four data points, for it, so it's a four-dimensional data set. Now, of course, you physically cannot represent four spatial dimensions in matplotlib or really physically in the first place, and so you need to reduce the dimensions if you want to visualize it in a way that would make sense to humans. So when you have this kind of visualization, it makes sense to a human. And it's essentially taken, using the principal component analysis algorithm, this whole 4D dimension, or this 4D vector space, and it's reduced it to three dimensions. Now, this is something that I want to do in Swift, but until now, it wasn't really all that easy because, well, Python libraries make it really easy to do this kind of principal component analysis and so, so much more. So how can I go ahead and implement these lines of Python code in Swift? Well, before we take a look at that, let's take a look at one more thing. Now, if I were to go into a different directory, say my desktop, and I still want to use that irisexample.py, what I do is I'd go into Python, I'd import sys, system, and into the system path, I'd append whatever directory I kept that Python file in. In this case, it's my home folder slash iris example. Now, if I append that, then even though iris example.py isn't in the current directory, I should still be able to import it into my Python instance, and then I should be able to go ahead and run the PCA and plot with matplotlib. There we go, that works. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at how we can do this in Swift. So, first of all, assuming you've already got Python kit installed, now you can go ahead and actually start using it. Now, this over here, these four lines of code, excluding the function and the brackets, these are what let you use that iris example code that I just wrote within Swift. Now, of course, you could rewrite the scikit-learn example to run entirely within Swift. That is definitely possible. But in this case, let's just take an example of actually running a custom Python file that we've created. And remember, this could, this could contain any Python code and run it through Swift. Now, the first thing we're doing over here is importing sys, okay? So we're doing this via python.import. Python is a class. Again, if you would actually use the Swift package manager, you would say import Python kit at the top of your file, but I've just included it as auxiliary code. Now, from here, you're going to go ahead and append to the path of sys, and this is how you do it. I know you might be wondering, well, what's the big deal? What you've got to understand is that sys is a variable of type Python object, okay? This is a generic object, any Python object, an integer, a float, a package, it could be quite literally anything. Now, path is not an attribute, it's not a function, it's nothing within Python object. But when you say path, what's happening is because Python object is actually a dynamic member lookup and a dynamic callable uh, class or struct, you're able to go ahead and access path and then access the append function and then pass this argument to the append function in order to append this to your path. And once that's done, you can go ahead and import the other package that we just created, the irisexample.py file. And then from there, you can run the plot PCI iris function that I had just described. Now, again, you've got to realize that iris example, this imported variable, this is a Python object. Plot PCA iris is not a function that has been defined within the Python object, um, let's see here, a struct. This is not a class, it's a struct. It has not been defined within it, but still, if you go back over to that definition, see over here, it is a dynamic callable and a dynamic member lookup struct. And because of that, I'm able to go ahead and call this function, and it acts just like I would actually get and then call this member of Python object. Now, one thing you should note is that, of course, because Apple is very strict on security, 
you will need to disable a few security features for this to work. Because in order for your Mac application to access this folder and then import this Python file, you're going to need to disable a capability of your application called App Sandbox. So on your Xcode project, if you go over to the capabilities pane, the second option you see here should be App Sandbox. Now, of course, originally this is going to be turned on. However, in order for this whole importing other Python packages that you write to work, you're going to need to turn off the App Sandbox in order to import this kind of code. And so that was a quick example of how exactly you can use Python code directly within Swift. And the interesting part is that in some cases, the syntax is actually similar enough that you can go ahead and run the exact same individual line of Python or Swift code in the other language. So for example, in Python, if I were to import sys, and in Xcode, if I were to do sys.path on append and then this whole uh, string, I could copy that line of code exactly into Python and it still works. The, sim the, the syntax in some cases is similar enough for that kind of thing to happen. It's very, very convenient to bring over your stuff from Python, finally, to Swift. In fact, there is so, so much more that you can do with this library. Like, for example, let's just say you wanted to do some interesting stuff with NumPy. You could say let NumPy is equal to, or let NP is equal to python.import NumPy. Right? And in, in Python, again, this would be import NumPy as NP. This line of code would be import NumPy as NP. Then you can go ahead and define your own little lists, or in Python, they'd be lists in Swift, they're arrays. And you can actually go ahead and convert them to NumPy arrays. So for example, if I were to say array A is equal to NumPy.array, and then literally just pass it a Swift array, and it'll automatically convert that to a Python list. It is really magical what's going on here. I could say four, three, seven, and then I can go ahead and create array B, which would be something like, I don't know, 9, 3, 5. And then I could say, you know, let result is equal to array A times array B. Now, even though these are technically arrays, like in regular Swift, you could not take two arrays and multiply them by each other. But because these are two Python objects, it's very flexible what you can do with them. Of course, NumPy will realize that this multiply would mean, you know, multiply each element of those two arrays. You can then go ahead ahead and print out that result just as if this were a regular Swift package and go ahead and run that and we should get a result. There we go. As you can see, it was that easy. It goes ahead and tells us if we scroll back up here that 4 times 9 over here, 36. First result, 3 times 3, 9, and 7 times 5. 35. And so that was a quick demo of how you can use Python Kit in order to integrate Python code directly into your Swift applications. And this is going to have huge implications for the, for the world of data science, machine learning, and practically everything that you were doing in Python, but simply could not transition over to Swift because, well, Swift wouldn't let you. Now, though, you can. So thank you very much for tuning in today. I do hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I do hope you enjoyed the start of a new series, Swift Today. I'm going to be releasing these tutorials in the first of every month. And of course, thank you very much for joining in today. I hope you did enjoy. If you did, please make sure to leave a like down below. If you do believe this could help anyone you know, like your family or friends, please make sure to share it with them as well. Apart from that, if you really do enjoy my content and you want to see more of it, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel as it really does help out a lot. And go ahead and turn on notifications if you'd like to be notified whenever I release a new tutorial. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. That's all I have for this tutorial. Goodbye.